Hey, it's Abdullah, and I think it might be time to retire Cappy. Just like the majority of General Motors products, it's lovable, but made with questionable quality and craftsmanship. This is the Nokia G11, the Nokia G21's less expensive twin. As I mentioned in my G21 review video, I think that phone finds a very nice balance between specs and experience, and the majority of the components on the G11 is similar to that phone. And while the G11 shares most of the same attributes, you do have to be a bit more careful about which version of the G11 you choose, as that could mean the difference between getting a phone that you happily keep and use versus a phone that you have to adapt to its limitations and work around them. Let's start with the basics. The hardware is pretty solid here. The phone feels nice and pretty sturdy, it sits quite comfortably in the hand, and most of the design choices are practical here. You have a fingerprint scanner which is integrated into the power button and it works quickly and reliably. There is a 3.5mm headphone jack and an SD card slot on top of being able to use two SIM cards, so you don't have to sacrifice between the second SIM card and your memory. But just like the G21, this device doesn't exactly look cutting edge, but it does get the job done. The only major complaint that I have here is on the camera plate on the back, which gets scratched very easily and it's quite difficult to keep clean. Now, battery life on the G11 is one of the key settings points and you'll see it all over the marketing of this device and I can confirm that it is indeed excellent. I'm getting a bit more than two days of usage after about 10 hours of screen on time with indoor outdoor usage and you can even push it up to three days if you're spending most of your time indoor on Wi-Fi with about three hours of screen on time per day. Now charging the battery on the other hand isn't exactly quick. It takes about 30 minutes to get about 40% of battery charge if you're using an 18 watts charging brick and the one that comes in the box is a 10 watts brick which takes 30 minutes to reach 25%. For multimedia consumption the 720p display is quite decent. Not the most pixel dense display out there but contrast, viewing angles and colors are all pretty good. And just like the G21 this also comes with a 90hz refresh rate but I'll cover that in a second. The single bottom firing speaker even offers decent clarity even at max volume, but it just isn't that loud. Now as for performance, this is where things get a bit tricky. The version I have here comes with 3 gigs of RAM and 32 gigs of onboard storage. And honestly, I didn't expect such a notable drop in consistency and in multitasking capabilities compared to the 4 gigs of RAM version of the G21 that I was using. I don't think it's a deal breaker particularly, depending on your usage. Which brings us to the 90Hz refresh rate. I wasn't enjoying the smoothness here as much as I was on the G21. Apps still open fairly quickly because it's essentially using the exact same processor, but smoothness is definitely not on the exact same level. And even outside of the RAM limitations, filling up 32 gigs of storage is something that happens so effortlessly these days. I was practically out of storage by just installing the apps that I use on a daily basis without any games and by just importing all the WhatsApp stuff that I have on other phones. And what happens with phone when you fill up their memory is that the performance definitely takes a hit. To try and solve this, I bought an SD card slot, but this led me to another issue. You can't install any applications on the memory card. You can only transfer your multimedia, such as photos, videos, and audio files. So if you like this phone and you do spend a lot of time on your phone on a daily basis, I would highly recommend the 4 gigs of RAM, 64 gigs of storage version. The experience will drastically improve and you'll be able to keep apps running in the background and multitasking with total ease without worrying about certain apps shutting down from the background to preserve RAM. And I also think it would help in the long term, especially after the device starts receiving updates. As for the camera, it's pretty basic as you would expect. If you care about imaging on a budget, then you're definitely better off getting the G21 which might not capture drastically better images in terms of resolved details, but the processing on that phone definitely helps elevate the images beyond what the G11 can offer. Of course, you can still capture decent images with the G11 if you're in good lighting conditions, but that's not really saying much. Even the selfie shooter on the G21, despite sharing the exact same hardware, does capture better images for exactly the same reason. The software on the G11 is stock Android 11. This means that you'll be relying on Google services for all the basics, while sacrificing some of the fine-tuning options you'll find on other Android skins, 
to benefit from less bloatware and the promise of updates. Now, in the case of the G11, you're getting two years of OS updates, so up to Android 13, and three years of security updates. To conclude, this phone has all the same core ingredients as the Nokia G21. It's a pretty basic phone that can offer a pleasant experience if you go for the right version. Alongside a nice, practical, sturdy build, stock Android and excellent battery life. If you don't care that much about the camera and are looking for an affordable Android smartphone with a hassle-free experience, this can be a pretty good option for you. If you want to learn more about the G11, you can check out my G21 review, which goes into a lot more details about every little aspect. Or you can check out my impressions video on both of these devices to understand the key differences between them on paper. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments below. That's it from me, and I'll see you in the next one.